Hi, I'm Dr. Mitch Hartland, and welcome to the Truth Talks podcast. My guest today is retired U.S. Navy Captain Jerry Coffey and his wife, Susan. I appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you so much. We are so happy to be here, right? We are really are happy to be with you. We've, we've watched some of your podcasts, and you just do such a great job bringing out the essence of the truth. There you go. And, and I appreciate that. And, you know, I was, uh, I was talking with producer Chad, and the first thing that we always want to tell everybody who served is we want to thank you for your service, number one. That's first and foremost. But the, the Jerry Coffey story uh, is more relevant in today's world than I think at any time. I, as I was listening to his story over and over, preparing for you guys, uh, I was like, my God, this is, this is truly the answer to what is going on in our country today and around the world. Would you agree with that? To a great extent, I, I certainly do. And, and Susan, kick in anytime you want um, and, and tell us everything from your perspective as well. Well, for, for one thing, I just want to let everybody know that Jerry is my hero. He's my husband, too. So I know a lot of things. But <laughs> all in all, I mean, he's the greatest guy. And, you know, whether he's the, a, a hero to many, he's a hero to me in my home. And, uh, and I, I know that we're not going to start out with this, but I kind of have to lead in a, in a way with uh, what he's been through in the last four years to kind of sort of like a preemptive to let you know, all your listeners and uh, viewers know that Jerry has been through an incredible medical storm in the last four or five years. And uh, in his, since he's been home, in spite of the fact that he's lived in just an amazing and active life, athletic life and, and everything and speaking all across the world, um, uh, it's some, of, some of his medical thing, uh, some of his injuries in prison caught up with him. And they, uh, he's had four heart attacks, three strokes. He's had a brain bleed. He has something called hydros, normal pressure hydrocephalus. I could go on, but, uh, but in spite of all that, he is, he is Jerry Coffey through and through. His heart and soul are, um, are red, white, and blue. And I'm at a, I'm at a rhyme. <laughs> you did. You did. <laughs> We'll make a song out of it. Uh, no, and so I, what I just want to say is that uh, what he can't uh, articulate as well as he used to be able to right now, and you can see why, um, I'm going to help him. So I just want you to know if you think, why is she talking so much? I'd like for her to not, be, not talk so much. I just want to help him get his message out because I do know the story, and he, he, he gives me permission to do that. In fact, he encourages me to. Is that okay? I, it's 100% okay. I just kind of feel like even just being in his presence is enough for me, to be honest with you. It's, I mean, I cannot even tell you how thankful I am to Jeff Royer for turning us on to, to you guys. It's just been absolutely mind-boggling to me. And do you know I've never seen Superman and Jerry in the same room? <laughs> is that weird? Coincidence, perhaps? Yes, yeah, like, that's right. I just wanted to tell you, you were talking about today, and Jerry and I spend a lot of time looking at, um, you know, what's going on in the country, right? And, and, right. and Jerry um, used to be more frustrated with things because he's, you know, we've seen a lot of things in this country, and we are divided now, but we were divided during Vietnam and that whole era of late 60s, early 70s, it was terrible. And, you know, Jerry has this wise um, philosophy of that things will get better. It's such an optimistic uh, belief in our country and the, um, you know, our, our systems and our, our constitution, all the things he swore allegiance to in those days when he, you know, held his hand up and became a naval officer, that, uh, that he feels optimistic. So all in all, he believes that our country and those who uh, love, it, love this country uh, will make it and survive, right? Am I saying and, that? And when I look at Susan, um, I, I, I'm reminded every time uh, that all the all the things about which we we're, we're so blessed, and um, 
she she is uh, a, a real hero in her own right, and uh, and I love her so much. <laughs> That's so awesome. You know the the Jerry Coffee story is almost a playbook to getting the country back to healing. Mm, maybe it is. It's unbelievable to me. It's like. It was literally the manual of, of healing the country, and, uh, and I'll, I'm going to get into that. I want to get into a little bit, first of all, what the Jerry Coffey story is. Uh, naval pilot, um, and it was in February 1966. You remember that? It's been a couple days ago. Does, does, does that day, uh, can you still picture it as if it was yesterday? In some respects, I can, yeah, but... Uh... So many good things have happened to the two of us <laughs> in the interim. <laughs> that, uh, uh, I, I don't ever dwell on that because we, we've come so far. You know, Mitch, I have to interrupt for a second because like, just last night uh, I found his log books, you know, uh, you know flight logs, yes. flight log books of every flight. And what I was looking for was actually his flights over Cuba during the Cuban Missile Crisis, because you know that's part of the sto his story, even came before Vietnam. You know, he took the pictures that showed um, President Kennedy that there were frog tip missiles, nuclear tip missiles in Cuba. But I found his logbook, and then I've, and we found those dates where he had circled the flights over Cuba and we had to match, you know, where he flew, and he began to remember where those flights were from Cecil Field to Boca Chica to Guantanamo and back to Jacksonville. And these were all delivering those photo reels that he had taken these low level flights fast and low over Cuba. And so we looked at that and we found those dates. And then I went, I decided to look at February 1966. I wish I could get them, I should show them to you, but it just basically said, um, February 3rd, it showed that because somebody else fills out those log books. This is a, a right. usually an, an enlisted, uh, I don't know what rank he is or whoever that's doing that. But um, so he had filled out February 3rd and he was flying off the Kitty Hawk and then it said missing in action. And that was it. And there were no more logs for seven years. Oh my goodness. I mean, <laughs> that just got me last night. I'm telling you, this was just last night we were looking at this. I've never seen that before. So. I I was talking and in, in a previous email that we had about the Cuban Missile thing. You know, it's always that kind of event that people then start to think about. And when I was going through his story, there is so much more. And it just seems like that seven years is a big focus. But there was there was already a hero there prior to Vietnam? Well, uh, I've been very blessed uh, in many ways. Uh, certainly, uh, just by the opportunity to make the, uh, the, to make the time that we've had uh, to our advantage. Well, that, that's what's so motivational to me um, with the story is, is just your time in there and, and how all that happened. I mean, just the moment that you were shot down and you guys ejected, and I know it was at 600 and some miles an hour, which is in, in one story you had, you had said, uh, if you're in a convertible going 600 miles an hour and then stand up, right? Which I think really hammered that home. Uh, I'm sitting there thinking, okay, that you know, you, you got, un you were knocked unconscious. Your arm, your forearm was broken. Your elbow was shattered, and and your your co-pilot uh, passed. Correct. Correct. And then that's when you guys were captured. And I think each time that I hear this story, I kind of hear something different in it. And the the first time I heard it, I kind of brushed over the the basically the 12 day journey to get to Hanoi. Yeah, and it was uh, very memorable. <laughs> and, and you're busted up. Did they give you any medical attention at all? Uh, very little, very little uh, medical attention. There wasn't much, much that they could do, really, at the time. Um, I had a broken arm and... Uh, uh, 
and he was able to uh, uh, set my arm to a to a way later way though. way later yeah and and I'm not really professionally mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. <laughs> probably probably not a lot of good orthopedic surgeons on the on the twelve uh, the twelve day journey over to Hanoi I'm guessing so our, this arm doesn't quite straighten out because they sh his elbow was shattered. But he's been able to play golf really, really well over the years. But this arm was really messed up. Yeah. And then they waited too long to put the cast on. And by that time, the swelling had gone down and, you know, the arm was bent at a certain angle. So they didn't do much good. You know, I know that, I mean, obviously you're a POW, we're at war, but um, were, were they, was during that journey of 12 days, was anybody sympathetic to you or were you just purely the enemy? Um, there were a couple of uh, women uh, that uh, expressed some uh, sympathy, uh, but uh, no, nobody that had uh, any, any uh, power to do anything about the situation for me personally, uh, but the, there were some uh, isolated incidents that, that uh, were, were uh, encouraging to me at that time, but not, uh, not, not a lot. <laughs> well, you know, you know what's funny about that, because you use the word women, and uh, you were a uh, very good-looking, strapping man. And even even when I saw you get off the plane after all that, you were still good-looking seven years after that. And I was always like, huh, that guy looks dang good for seven years in prison. <laughs> well, I don't know. Um, I, I, being able to move around was, was, a, <laughs> was a big deal. <laughs> So when we got, when you got finally to Hanoi, and in a lot of your story you talk about, you hear that big wooden door shut, and that big iron, iron uh, latch clang, uh, that sells four foot by six and a half feet, and sometimes when I was listening to your story, I would kind of just close my eyes, and I would be like, I wanted to kind of try and put myself there, and I know you were a Navy pilot, and I know that, you know, that there's no doubt you're a tough guy. But man, when that door slams, was there a split second at any moment where you thought, man, this is it for me? Every time, every time that I was back, back in, and and there was uh, uh, so. the cell, uh, I, I, I never knew when it was going to get out, if at all. If at all. I mean, again, I close my eyes and I think about that and and if I'm not mistaken, uh, you, your wife was pregnant at the time. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, she was. So there's just so many things, obviously, that's playing in someone's mind. And it, it just, it even makes me so much more impressed with what you've done and, and how you came through that. I mean, it's just, it, it's truly when you hear the word hero, now Gerald Coffey, Jerry Coffey is who I think about when I hear that word. It just, it just blows me away how kind of emotionally attached to the story that I got because I think there's so much more meaning, and I think we're going to get down there, and I'm going to open it up with this segment. So we're doing a podcast with a guy by the name of Jeff Royer, and he was an FBI agent, had some dealings with the whole 9-11, and he ends up going to prison for seven years um, and this guard, uh, the book guy, uh, happened to be coming by, and he says, want a book? They throw in this book. That's, that's the book that they give to him. And he's telling us this whole story, and the whole entire story of the 9-11 conspiracy or, or, or podcast that we did, the episode we did with him, the main feature that got him through that entire process was your book. How, how does that make you feel? Well, it makes me feel good about, about the, the good that I saw from it. And uh, the way that you guys uh, used it uh, for the, the general good uh, 
was uh, in inspiring to me that you were able to get so much good from what was available. Um, I was very pleased to be able to, to put a, a good, a, a happy, not a happy <laughs> face, but a, a, happy story. a positive, yeah. a positive experience. It was, it was so positive, actually it was so positive that Susan and I, we were talking and, and uh, along with Jeff, we, wa we want to get this book in every prison. Matter of fact, I want to get this book to every single person because of the, the just unbelievable, I mean, it literally truly is the manual to save in the country and save in the world that we live in today. And I don't know if it had the same impact when you wrote it, um, but usually a, a book doesn't become so incredibly more relevant over time quite like this has. So we're we're going to promote the heck out of this thing and uh, hopefully get a ton of people reading this thing because it, it truly is the game plan. It, it, and and we'll, I'm going to go into some of the codes of life. We're going to talk a little bit about the story and the, and the time that you were there. But one, a couple things I, I remember specifically that stood out for me was the Hanoi Hustle. Yeah. That was your, your moving back and forth uh, three feet at a time. Is that correct? Right. That's right. Miles a day. Miles. <laughs> Miles a day. The shuffle. Yeah, we know you know. Yeah, shuffle. shuffle. Yeah. Three feet at a time, miles a day. You know what what's how we apply this in, in a today's world. I mean, we, we all we're we're complain, we're entitled to all kinds of stuff. And I believe if everybody read this book, I think instantaneously we would all be far more grateful for everything that we have and we get to do and the freedoms that you guys provided uh, by doing that. I, again, it's just that profound to me. You said you, you guys, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there were several of us that were particularly uh, um, helpful to each other uh, in ways that were, that were just incredibly uh, well basically helpful mm -hmm. and for each each other certainly and and that was um a kind of a, a key word because it uh it really was a, a um, an, an opportunity to use each other to uh, uh get through Unity over self. Yeah, unity over self. Was don't, don't you be jumping ahead of me, Jerry Coffee, because I got a whole bunch of the tapping code. I, I got it all, buddy. I got it all in here. I, I, think, I, I think I rewrote your whole book, actually, as I was going through there. <laughs> what, one, of the, one of the really cool things in, in a lot of the speeches that you had done over time, you know, one of the kind of the big things we got was, the, you know, the four things of, of, of your faith, right? Uh, and how that really got you through there. One of them was uh, the time when you said that you stopped asking God, why me? And, and I thought that was one of the most powerful statements ever, and you transitioned that into um, uh, God, show me. Show me. And I thought that was one of the most powerful statements ever because I think nowadays current views is we don't ever get to the God, show me. I think we're, we always stick at the God, why me? And I think that's why this is so relevant today. Yeah, it's true. It is. And we don't have to uh, look very far to, uh, to see the, the answer uh, when, you, when we say, show me. Which is so powerful. And in each speech that you did, it was just one layer of more power on the other. And now you had no idea you're staying there seven years. You don't know if you're there seven days, seven months, seven years, 70 years. Yeah. You don't know. So at what point, after that big wooden door clinked and that big old metal thing went inside to, to lock the door, I know in a couple speeches that you, had, you have previously done... Um, there was a time factor there until you said, okay, I don't know when I'm going to be. I need to learn all this stuff about me and about the situation to bring back later on. How, how long into that was, did, you, did you come up with that conclusion? Uh, very early on, uh, because uh, we all realized that uh, we were faced with uh, a situation that was very unique. 
<clears throat> and it was important to uh, make the experience uh, positive and to learn as much as, as we possibly could from that and, and, how, and how we can uh, use the experiences uh, to uh, come out better. That, that's, that's what I, I think I loved the most about this. I'm going to go down a couple different things and just get, just get your insight on these, because I think this is just something amazing. One, one of the first things that I wrote down was that you minimize the value of yourself to the enemy. Well, that's true. That's, that's, that was right. That was our, our uh, constant uh, uh, effort was to minimize my value to the enemy uh, and uh, to uh, not just to minimize the value, but to take advantage of, of any opportunity to stick it to him. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, I, I think you're going to see as we go down this, I, I noticed as I was doing this, this incredible transformation that happened. And I think we're going to see this as we get going on. Second thing that I wrote down was staying in as good physical condition as you possibly could. Amen. Amen. And, th and that, uh, that, that speaks for itself. Uh, whether you're in, in uh, a uh, Hanoi prison or whether you're bopping down the, the streets of uh, freedom uh, that, you, that you want to take advantage of, you use that opportunity, no matter what it is, to uh, be better because of it. You know, you know, I picture, I picture myself. I mean, this is this is going to be in my brain forever. But I now, every time I hear anything, I'm thinking. First of all, you know, you know, the braces. What would Jesus do? I, I think there needs to be one. On the other hand, says, "What would Jerry do?" Because I'm sitting there thinking, you know, to today, people are like, "Oh, my gym is closed down, and it's like the end of the world." And I'm thinking, Jerry Coffey walked miles three steps at a time. Are you kidding me? You know, you become kind of an emotional robot because, uh, you know, the, the, when the person tells me my gym is shut down, I can't get to the gym, I'm thinking, Jerry Coffey would slap you in the head right now. He just, he just walked several miles, three steps at a time. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah. And, uh, and, and sometimes in Hanoi, uh, that would occur to me that, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, don't pre, pre dead, prejudge that particular situation because uh, you, you, you're gonna, it's gonna be better pretty soon. <laughs> what about this one? Keeping your brain alive through the tapping, the foreign language, uh, all the knowledge that you shared. It was almost like you guys got a universal education in there. Keeping that brain alive. That's right. That way, that way, that was the way we are. That was our part of our uh, determination in making that uh, aspect of the of the prison uh, better for yourself. And um, and by the time we uh, finish, um, you know, by the time we fi finish uh, the uh, situation, uh, you would. In some cases, you would have uh, used used our our, our mind to uh, enhance our our uh, our enhance enhance our uh, effort to uh, uh, be better, to be, to be stronger, and to be sharper, and to be. Uh, um, smarter than uh, they were. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you know, I, I, I think of this too. Um, you know, my son came up to me here just a couple nights ago, and um, he's like, Dad, I'm bored. You know, and, and Susan, I'm telling you right now, we're, we're going to get the band that says, what would, you know, what would Jerry do? <laughs> they, they, uh, I was sitting there thinking after I was again preparing for this, and I'm sitting there thinking, my gosh, you know what? Read a book. Keep your mind sharp. What do you mean you're bored? You should never be bored. Read a book. Learn something new. Uh, this is the lessons that I got from listening to your speeches and to listening and, and to reading the book. It's like, 
my gosh, even myself, who I, I try and always keep things going, keep things moving, doing new things, and, and yet my, my son comes up and he says, Dad, I'm bored. I'm thinking, wait, no, you, you don't get to be bored. <laughs> you can't be bored. You can't be bored. Read a book. Learn something. <laughs> How about this one? Using the time for solidarity, for positivity. Yeah, when you have nothing but yourself to uh, go back into your, to your uh, consciousness and uh, figure out what you're going to do today uh, when you've already done it. <laughs> 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 and and uh, just, yeah, I mean, make it, it's easy to say, but it's not, not as easy to, uh, uh, to react um, in a way that uh, you, you use the uh, dead place uh, in there. Uh, you, you use it to uh, learn something. And uh, you are always learning. You, always, you are always learning. Uh, about yourself about too. yourself and and the thing uh, things around you and the people with you um, which weren't me most of the time but nevertheless for whatever there was uh, you use use the, your ability whatever it is to um, accelerate uh, uh, excel and uh, that was that was uh, whatever you could you could learn and uh, reapply in some some way was uh, constant. You know what what's so powerful to me about that, Jerry, is that you know there's there's a saying that a, a man's worst enemy is 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 his alone time with his own mind. You completely flipped that around and made that a positive and. And you know we we've done we've done a podcast uh, about suicide, um, addiction. Um, listen, I, that that again, this is like the playbook to heal the world here, the Jerry Coffee playbook to heal the world. And it's like, you know, you're there by yourself. You're in this cell. Uh, did you? There's probably no time to not love yourself, right? You had to learn how to love yourself and and stay alive. Uh, that's true. Yeah, I never put it that way myself, but thinking, thinking about it, but uh, it's really true. Uh, and you, in, in, a, in that process, you would try to um, use, use the time that I had uh, in a positive way. And, and uh, <clears throat> sometimes I feel like I'm, I'm, or I used to feel like I'm really, uh, Doing things that uh, I've already I've already already done, and and uh, and how did I, how should I how can I make this new for myself? Taking the same day, day after day, but finding a way of making something new. That that's the statement of the century, right there. I mean, that is uh, yeah, that is powerful, man. That is incredibly powerful. How about the prisoner of woe is me? <laughs> <laughs> what was you? What was me? me? <laughs> what was me? Right, right. And 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 uh, that was that was a common feeling sometimes, but it wouldn't take long to get through it, and 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 to use what was me uh, as a as a uh, trigger to. Uh, Think about uh, what was me, and uh, and how how we we're able to use that time uh, to to not say that very often. You know, I, I again, I, I was sitting there, and I I would kind of close my eyes, and I would visualize it. You were on a twenty inch slab of concrete with these wooden shackles around your leg on your belly with your hands behind your back um i mean i again i i don't, I don't think i could do it i may i may maybe it's the time when you're in that situation you find this incredible strength and and it maybe it was your faith and so on and so forth that got you through it but 
it's almost unfathomable to come through something like that, but yet you did it. Like, like anybody would have, I think. It might have required different, uh, different approaches here and there, but uh, it's the same thing that uh, uh, every, every man there find a way to do it. I want to ask you this question because I think this one might get a little laugh out of you, but how, uh, how important was that rosary where you were able to use that to let the handcuffs off a little bit to rest your shoulders at night? Oh, man, it was essential. And uh, the little rosary was terrific in, uh, in its uh, spiritual value as well. And, uh, and, and how much we... Um, I'm not sure I was able to derive from that. Even in a certain way, did you kind of feel like certainly that was a gift from God, just to get that extra little rest? Yeah, so absolutely. And, and, and finding little gifts of God was very common. <laughs> yeah, I bet, like anything, like the smell of fresh air. You know, one of the, one of the ways that you describe the cell itself was it, there was a stench of, of the people that had been there prior before you. And again, that's, that's one of those things that I, I envisioned uh, when listening to your story each and every time and how you, again, you get past that, not knowing how long your stench is going to be there or if that is the end for you. And that, that's, why it's, that's why you're just such an icon, such a hero, and, and I'm going to turn as many people on to your story as I possibly can because I, I don't think I've heard a better one, to be honest with you. And I'm not blowing smoke just because Susan agreed so quickly to help us out here. This is a true feeling of how we feel here. Sometimes uh, she's here. Susan has heard, heard me speak so many times that uh, sometimes, she, sometimes she fills in the space for me. <laughs> oh, I tell you, I have enjoyed speaking with Susan, and, I, and I'm hoping we continue to speak because uh, um, we're, we're going to do some great things with this book. I do believe it is the playbook for the world. Tell, tell me about this uh, going to slab at night. And, and that's literally what you called it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because it was uh, uh, a slab is all we had. <laughs> and it was concrete, right? It was concrete, yeah. And uh, well, uh, early on, it was boards, but uh, ended up being mostly slab. Uh, Concrete. This may not be relevant to a lot of people, but it kind of is to me. What was it? Were you cold at night? I mean, I'm, I'm just, I could literally, I could talk to you for 20 hours on this. I, I get curious, like when you're there, what do you, I know you had like those, I saw like the little pajama looking things with the flip flops and, but like, was it cold at night? Was it hot? Was, what was that like? It was usually cold at night. Um, and and uh, we had a, a sweatshirt that uh, we used for a pillow and, and a mattress and, <laughs> and anything that would, that would give you some uh, relief uh, from, the, from the hard uh, hard concrete. That's just amazing. You utilized everything, didn't you? Your mind everything utilize the mind the sweatshirt the i bet you utilized every single thing that you could even see you can you were sure of it that's right now now jerry here's one thing i, I gotta tell you because i i thought this was kind of funny and and we're probably gonna make one of our past guests a little bit upset with this but i'm willing to take the roll of dice here so we interviewed a navy seal chad williams and he's telling me about hell week and i'm like oh my god that is just terrible <laughs> and then i meet jerry coffee and i'm thinking hell week hell with hell week are you kidding me this is seven years man <laughs> it was only going to last another uh, a few days <laughs> yeah you got five days of hell week this guy's seven years i'm like jerry is the badass here we kept talking we kept saying Oh my God, you know, Chad, you're just a badass. I mean, it's the, these are the elite, the badass. And believe me, I'm not knocking any Navy SEALs because I don't want any of that kind of trouble. But Jerry Coffey is the ultimate badass. It's a good way to put it. 
Yeah, yeah. I'm trying not to offend those guys, you know. They go all day. But it truly is. I mean, when you think about that, and, and I was, as I was doing that podcast, I get so into it, and, and I'm like, this guy's telling me about they're carrying the boats, and, and, and Chad is the most wonderful storyteller ever. He's just amazing. And, and, and he's talking about, you know, they're laying in that cold water, and that was miserable, and the sand, and, and man, I, I bought completely into it until I hear the Jerry Coffee story, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, that's a whole nother level. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, is that crazy thinking or, I mean, it really hit me like that. No, it's understandable that it would hit you like that, as you put it. Uh, oh, my God. I, again, I, I know producer Chad's probably like, man, this guy keeps saying the same thing, but it, it, I know it's, I, it's unbelievable how much you touched me. How about tap code? Yeah, go ahead, Susan. Well, I just want to say one of, one of the things I think about when you compare these pilots most of the POWs were pilots, of course, and they weren't trained for that kind of extraordinary environment. I mean, they, they went to Siri school, you know, um, where they learned for a few days, you know, how what might happen if you were found out in the woods or out somewhere where you couldn't be, be uh, uh, rescued. But uh, they're not trained like, you know, Marines or most of them weren't Marines. But e even so, they weren't trained nearly way navy seals or special forces were so right. these guys are, they're pilots i mean they're the ones that go in the ready room and have a hot cup of coffee and then they go party and then they go to happy hour <laughs> and whatever you know now susan i wasn't more extraordinary too that they susan i was not trying to paint it like that i was not trying to paint these guys where they never have to sign their shoes even when they go on a mission but you just did <laughs> <laughs> It, it is, it is just extraordinary to me. I mean, extraordinary. It's amazing how many guys uh, learn lessons that uh, were very weird. And uh, one of the things that we finally learned was um, sitting on a toilet seat. <laughs> They're always the best stories. <laughs> because there was a, a rim that was... It was to explain that you you had to go to the bathroom in a bucket. Yeah. In a bucket. Yeah. In a bucket, but you, but you wouldn't squat for very long. Uh, you, you look for some place to set your butt down. <laughs> <laughs> and... And and that was uh, and that took a lot of different uh, different uh, techniques. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so get to the point is that you didn't learn. He didn't learn how to really effectively use his rubber tired shoes that they gave him. They made out of rubber tires. Right. So put. To put it like around like, the toilet, like seat. This, I mean, the, on the toilet uh, and make a toilet seat. seat on the bike. And it wasn't until like it, after seven years or six <laughs> and a half years that he learned learned from somebody to do that. So, <laughs> well, you know what? One of the thing I thought about when yes, with with the tap code was how how ingenious this is, and again, something that until you're faced with the most unbelievable circumstances just how creative the mind gets. As, as Susan said, it wasn't that you were trained for that, and yet you developed that. That's what is absolutely mind-boggling to me. Yeah, and it, and it was it's mind-boggling to me also uh, when I think about uh, all, the, all the various ways that we learn to use um, um, tap code that uh, w evolved from the necessary uh, uh, way, ways that we were able to communicate with each other. Just absolutely mind-blowing to me, like uh, how you guys were able to come up with that. You know, I'm going to go to the next life lesson here. Um, you know, we, we've got a lot of division going on in, in the country and, and so on and so forth, but when you were in that situation, one of the things that you said that I thought was really profound is you got to love every single person in there just like a brother. That's right. That's exactly true. How important was it to, for you to hear somebody every night? 
many times there was nobody there to be, to, to hear. And uh, you would, uh, and that's when it would, was um, important to be able to uh, talk to yourself, not literally, but figuratively. And, uh, and, and uh, be a good listener. <laughs> <laughs> be a good listener to yourself. I mean, again, but you know what? That you know, we laugh at that, but what an, what a powerful statement that is. You know, unfortunately, sometimes we listen to ourselves too much, and we'll talk ourselves down to, you know, we're too fat, we're too this, we're too that, and uh, how you speak to yourself speaks volumes, and and I'm sure you would agree with that. It's true, and, and uh, was uh, it was possible to get get you down. Uh, so far that you, you have to stop and think think to myself, wait a minute, I don't want to, that's not what I want to be thinking about today or, or tomorrow or anytime because that's, that's not productive. Yeah. I'm sure of that, right? I mean, it, I can't imagine day after day after day how, how easy it would be to talk yourself into to thinking the worst. Um, Again, that's what makes us just so incredibly powerful. There is something that was written on the wall, Jerry, that um, it says God equals. God equals strength. God equals strength. Did you see that every night? Yeah. And uh, another thing, Jerry, that was just uh, incredible to me when you were telling the story that um, at night you may do the tap of God bless or good night. Right. Uh, just a, a GB. Uh, GB. <laughs> just a GB, or uh, it didn't matter if, if the GB, God bless, uh, GBA, God bless America. Mm -hmm. the, the patriotism that you guys showed at, at that point in time, um, it, that's just kind of a, it's an unbelievable type of, feeling that I get with that, like a, a sense of unbelievable pride and the unbelievable love for the country that we're in. And, and I, I really feel like that's missing right now. And that is such the reason why I had to have this story for so many reasons. The perseverance that is beyond uh, one that's imaginable for people. The second one is, you know, the faith and, and how that got you through uh, all those years and kept you so positive, how you controlled your mind and your body, um, and then getting to that final aspect where you get to find that freedom again. I, I can't imagine how much your heart and your mind feels about how grateful you are to live in the country that we do today, and, and, and I hope that, that by telling your story, uh, we can instill that exact same thing um, into the generation that I'm in and the generations to come. That, that's how important you are, Jerry Coffey. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I, I really do. Um, when I when I look at the my my buddies there and the things that we went went through to, uh, together, and more recently. Uh, I've gotten to know uh, a lot of the other POWs were before I was, and uh, and then we, when we came home, uh, we we look at each other, and uh, it seems like sometimes uh, GBU, GBU, God bless you, you know, uh, was was a um, a time that. Uh, Every one of us uh, remembers, and uh, the GBU uh, was one of the one of the best times that we had to remember. Just the GBU. Something so simple, right? Something so simple. Yes, exactly. Unbelievable. You know, uh, again, we we wanted this show so bad. Um, I can't even tell you how grateful I am for you guys coming on and sharing this story. And, and, and I want to ask your permission. Um, I would love to have your blessing to be able to share a lot of these Jerry Coffee stories with 
my generation and the generations to come, and I hope someone after me picks up the Jerry Coffee story and takes it. Do we have your blessing to share some of that? Absolutely, yes, uh, and that's the way the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I want to encourage you to use it. <laughs> I, I appreciate that so much. And, and I know, Jerry, I know that, um, you know, all the health conditions you've had, and I know sometimes finding words and, and so on and so forth. I want you to keep speaking to people. If you only have one word, just sit there. And even if you just say hi, it is, it is so worth it, man. I just, uh, I, I want to tell you guys that we feel here at True Talks just absolutely blessed to even have this amount of time with you. I thank Susan so much because you were instrumental in putting all this together and, and really getting this out. You're going to see what producer Chad does. He's going to make this incredible. Uh, we're going to try and make you guys proud of, of what it is that we can do for your story. And again, I thank you from the bottom of our hearts um, that you were able to come on this, this show and, and, uh, and tell us your story. We'll, we'll be looking forward to hearing it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Chad. I, you, Chad. I just want to tell you right now that you uh, taught me a lesson today, and that is that Jerry, I, I sorted out by saying that Jerry has some deficiencies, you know, that he, over time, but he really doesn't because you brought out from him what he hasn't said in maybe three years. So thank you for doing uh, that for him okay. and for your audience. My, my honor, it's my honor. I mean, I, I, I'm just so honored to, to even be sitting here in front of you guys. And I want to stay in touch. When you're in Boulder, I need to know. All right. I absolutely need to know. And if there's anything that we can do, Susan and I are going to work. We're going to get, uh, we're going to work real hard on uh, getting this book out to everyone. We're going to work on in, in the prisons, prisons, uh, just how it changed Jeff's life. And, but again, I, I do believe that this book literally is the playbook to healing the world today. I, I really do. I, I believe that with all my heart. So again, thank you guys so much. You enjoy the rest of your day in sunny Hawaii um, <laughs> while we're freezing to death out here. But uh, I just absolutely love you guys. Hey, listen, you thank too. you so much for, for giving us the time. Really. GBU. G GB. 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 Love it so much. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Okay. You're welcome. All right.